All right, everyone, we're back. Welcome to another episode of Comedy Sports DNI Talks. I am your host, Luis Cortez. I am a longtime comedy sports player here in Chicago and also in Los Angeles, and now I serve as our Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Now, we started this show a few weeks back to introduce everyone to our ensemble, but also to introduce everyone to their stories, their backgrounds, uh, the things they've gone through so that we can learn from our mistakes of the past and also start to make some uh, better moves for the future. And also just to normalize these sort of conversations within our ensemble, within our theater, uh, within our fans and everyone who comes around and watches all of these. We like to use these as a resource, not just for us, but for everyone to, um, to make this a little bit more mainstream and not so taboo living in the shadows. Uh, today, I am joined by another one of our ensemble members. Uh, I have known them for a few years now. I don't exactly remember when we actually met, but I'm sure we'll figure it out right now. Uh, please welcome ensemble member, Justin Swinson. <laughs> Hold for applause. Beep, 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 beep. I'll add that, I'll add that noise. Oh, right. thank you. I'm just learning to edit, but I'll do it. I'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, please welcome ensemble member Justin Swinson. <laughs> it reminds me of my favorite match that you were refereeing once where that noise went off in the background and you just shouted, Latinos! And I'm like, that's just, I can't say that just out loud all the time, but I just love thinking of that because it makes me laugh so much. The first time I ever heard that sound, I think might have been like a Daddy Yankee song or something <laughs> where like they would do that and every time someone yells Latino and I was like, and, and <laughs> I, I now equate the two. So yeah. even like I planned it, it literally, I heard the sound and it was just so second nature that I just yelled it out. <laughs> Just uh, so many random DJ noises that are just stuck in my brain like that, like a bomb dropping. And it's just like those two back to back for some reason. I knew that's when a new song was coming out. That was just the thing. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, those things that just kind of cue that uh, that sense memory and you can't help but just jump right into it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, how are you, my friend? You know what? You Most days I say, yeah, you know, I'm just doing as best as good as I can. But today I actually feel Pretty damn great. I can't lie. I got like a lot of sleep last night. I woke up and like the sun woke me up and I was like, today's pretty good. Today's a pretty good day. You have that sort of setup in your room where like the sun just kind of drapes itself over your face and you do that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The bed, like the bed is set up right, right with the window. So like whenever the sun comes up, it like just bathes me in its glow. And I'm like, oh, it's morning. Oh, that's and today nice. it wasn't like a, uh, it's morning. It's it's hard for me to to sleep with a lot of light, so I I have mm -hmm. uh, I have blackout curtains. Oh, um, same, same. So when I when I wake up, it is very much just like I'm in my cave until I go to <laughs> my glasses on and go downstairs. Um, I also have you know my three dogs, and we our bedroom is upstairs, but only one of them can do the stairs anymore. Oh, um, so. I have to like carry two dogs up the stairs at night and then carry two dogs down the stairs in the morning. It's good exercise, if nothing else though. No, I mean, one is one is a, you know, 20, 24 pound dog uh, to get me started. And then mm -hmm. the big dog is uh, a 50 pounder. So yeah, yeah. so that, that that's that's my that's my warm up and the other one's my cool. <laughs> um, so Justin, thank you so much for yeah. being here. I'm very excited to, uh, to chat. Um, for, for people that don't know, the, the, the general standard opening question being, uh, tell us a little bit about you and then tell us where your improv journey started. Okay, um, so I grew up in a, a little pocket right outside of Washington, D.C. called Prince George's County. Uh, it's a pretty much the main thing Prince George's County is known for is a lot of pretty decent basketball players come out of there and it's a majority uh, black neighborhood. So I always tell people that I live in Chicago now. I've lived here for a couple of years, but I always say Chicago is the whitest place I've ever lived in um, because you get here and it's kind of this culture shock of, yes, there are like 5 million people and half of them are white. This is, it's, it was all very much a new thing. Uh, so I grew up in Prince George's County and growing up, I wasn't really outgoing. I, I would say it would probably be the best way. Like I, it's funny now, 
uh, saying that I do like theater and I perform and I get on stage in front of people because that was not me as a child at all. Uh, before college, I was, I think I was in maybe two plays all of grade school. Um, I was very much like, I, this is uncomfortable. Everyone's looking at me. I don't know what's happening. Uh, I did a lot of sports. I was like, I don't have to talk. I can just focus on the game and it's easy. You win or you lose. This I can handle. This I can do. Um, but in high school, I messed up my legs pretty bad. Uh, so I was like, well, I think I'm going to have to do something else and figure out how this is going to go. So I actually initially started college with the intention to do graphic design. Um, but I had a couple friends who were who were into theater and they kind of dared me to audition for a play. Uh, and I got a part. It was, I'll never forget the glass menagerie. Uh, you brought the glass menagerie? <laughs> yeah. Who did you Justin. play? <laughs> I played the friend of the main character who comes over and like makes out with like the main character's sister. <laughs> it's such a weird, such a like weird first play for someone to be in. That is like, I mean, that's Tennessee Williams. So you yeah, it's like, it's dripping with drama. The yeah. Mystery is so glassy, like. And I'm sweating under my suit the entire time, every show, because I am so nervous and do not want to mess up a line or forget my blocking or anything like that. But the experience really kind of changed the trajectory of my life, really. Um, as that happened, I kind of started like hanging out with all the theater kids more and started having a lot of fun with them. And I would go to these graphic design classes, which were three hours long and you sit in a dark room and you just work on like, you know, a Mac and you're trying to put together like some sort of like really cool font for whatever product you think you're going to design or something like that. And you're like, after a while you start thinking, man, this is kind of, kind of boring. I don't know if I want to do this for the rest of my life or the next five years or the next 10 years or whatever it would be. Uh, so I end up changing my major and taking the leap, um, of course, to the shock of my parents. <laughs> God bless them. Uh, and yeah, getting into the theater thing. And by the time I had finished school, um, we did Glass Menagerie and all that stuff. And all the plays I did in college, they were all very serious. Like it was like, we did the Glass Menagerie. There was Fat Pig. There's like just a lot of like very serious, weighty, heavy stuff. And like at 20 years old, I'm just like, I just want to have fun. I want to make people laugh. I That I'm felt like, always kind of like my thing. Did you go to college? Yeah. Uh, so Prince George's Community College is where I changed my major, which is also, man, great way to save money. Just go to like a... I went to a community college. I went to Santa yeah. Monica Community College and it was the nice. best decision I ever made. And yeah, go not only was it like, I think it's like the best community college in California, which is already Ooh. awesome. It was like one of the best ones in the country. Teachers from like UCLA and USC would teach at this school just because they're like, have a free Tuesday. Um, and so like we had some great teachers. It was a great school and you're right. Like I was not really sure what my major was gonna be. So I got all my mm -hmm. requirements done in two years, saved a yeah. big mess of money. Yeah, oh I, my God. for anyone out there at community college, consider it. I tell you, it's crazy. I just went back there last year and when I went there, they had a very old, at the time it was like a 50 year old theater. It was a big, beautiful building though, but it was 50 years old. And of course it's falling apart. And now they they have this brand new state of the art place that has a giant theater space, a black box, rooms for actual classes. Like we had to take our classes up in the attic essentially um, for a lot of our class. Like I remember we had to take a, a movement class in the gym for a while and stuff. And now they have this giant, beautiful like facility and stuff. And it's kind of crazy now to go back and think about it. Cause it's like, oh man, these kids are like so lucky who get to go here now and like experience this beautiful building. Thank so it's kind of weird to be like, I had a part of that maybe just a tiny bit, a little <laughs> tiny <laughs> bit. Those little <laughs> things where you're like, I, I could like just boast and boast. It's like, I, I know I had a little bit to do with that, but not yeah. so I'm like, see that you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, I don't, my name's probably not in there anywhere, but like I, I had a tiny hand involved. And that's like, yeah, really nice to know. So by the time 
that had wrapped up, I was pretty much like, I kind of want to, I got to get out of here one, because that's pretty much a lot of the DC area's kind of theater is very like serious and dramatic. And there's not really a huge space for comedy. And that's always kind of been something I gravitated towards as a kid. Uh, Luis, you know this, like we're both big Simpsons fans and that kind of has always been, I feel like my biggest comedy influences were The Simpsons, Martin, and Saturday Night Live. And um, Eddie Murphy, of course, because he was undeniable in those times. But like, yeah, so that's always kind of been, I was just like, how can I get to maybe move somewhere in that direction? And a teacher was like, maybe you should look at Chicago and look at the second city. And I looked around, I was like, there's nothing really like that here. And New York was super expensive and California felt too far at the time. So I was like, all right, let's give it a shot. So I really got all the way here without really taking one improv class, which is, I don't know if that's an anomaly or not, but it seems like an unconventional path. They've never even, a, I think I did one improv workshop in college, which looking back was led by two college students, which may not have been the, <laughs> the greatest way about going to having a, your first improv workshop. But other than that, I had zero experience in improv. I mean, if you watch the one with Miguel, he talks about like, he grew up on the west side of Chicago. And when someone mentioned Second City to him, he was just like, I have no clue what that is. So <laughs> he came in as blind as you. Um, yeah. Now what, um, so you, you're 20, uh, graduating college, you just finished all these super serious dramatic, uh, dramatic plays. At what point do you actually move to Chicago? How old are you when you landed here? Oh gosh, I was 20. Well, what's funny was I had taken some time because I was spacing everything out. So I believe I got here. God, it feels so long ago now. I think I was 26, 20, 26. Yeah. It's probably somewhere around that seems about right. Yeah, because I had taken a couple years just to save some money. And I feel like I actually had to come to the conclusion, okay, I'm doing it. I'm going to move. This is where I want to go. And I actually came out here for about a week beforehand, um, maybe about a year before I officially moved, just to get a get the feel of the place and see if it was actually right for me. And, you know, you you walk around, you go to Wrigley Field for a day, you see a couple Second City shows, you see, a, and of course, down the street was I.O. at the time. Uh, and then you're like, yeah, this this seems right. I think I'm gonna do this. Um, so yeah, I got here at that point. And even then I had to take a year just to like, I literally moved here without a job in place. I didn't know, I knew one person. Uh, I had my one friend help me move into my third floor studio walk up um, on like a hot July morning. And then it was just, yeah, it was intense. And then it was like, okay, I guess I can, I'm here, I'm in Chicago. And then it's like the whole thing of finding a job and trying to find some people that are your friends and all that sort of thing. And so I didn't end up even starting a class at Second City until, God, maybe eight months after I had moved in. Yeah, because it was, I wanna say it was like right around that polar vortex or something like that is when I officially That's started long ago. taking class. No, 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 I think maybe Oof, doing the math now, Ooh, uh, set six years, maybe. Yeah, I think it's coming up on six years this year. So like 2015. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so I was not, I was not that far behind you because I didn't land here until 2016. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think we we've been in Chicago around the same time. So you were around 26, about six years ago. You land in Chicago and it's it's your first time being surrounded by this sort of culture and this amount of white people. <laughs> yeah. Huge culture shock, which yeah. I totally relate to because I had the exact same thing. And I, I'm coming from mm -hmm. LA, which is mm -hmm. a very diverse city, but that 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 uh, Midwest lifestyle was something that I had never experienced. That that Midwest nice that they like to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, because man, no one is, I like to say no one is nice in DC. If they're being nice to you, they want something from you. That's that's usually what it is. There's some sort of power play happening. Um, and just the speed of everything here is different too, actually. It feel, I didn't know what people meant until I moved out here. Things just move a 
tiny bit slower. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I can't really say, um, but it is, it's something to adjust to. Yeah, it's, it is something to adjust to though. So yeah. Oh, it, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, it, it, it took truly, a bit. Yeah, even now I'm still, there are days where I'm like, man, I wish things were a little faster. And then like, I go home for like the holidays or something for a couple of days and I'm like, eh, it's, it's not so great here. <laughs> like it's not, the speed is fine here. Things are, everything's all right. It was, but yeah, the, it, yeah, the, the, the biggest, that the biggest difference back home was like, if you go down to like Orange County, for whatever reason, because it, Orange County is a lot of money, predominantly white, but for mm -hmm. whatever reason, like everything around Orange County shuts down at like eight or nine. I think it's just that like, you know, we have our money, we like our privacy, we don't want a lot of nightlife, like this is why we move here sort of thing. So, yeah. you know, even just going an hour away was like, why is everything closed? It's only nine. <laughs> you know, but they're coming out here and seeing that different sort of hustle and the buses and the, the I mean, we had buses in LA, but like the subway, yeah. like just yeah. the lifestyle of boom, 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 boom. I was yes. like, oh, okay. Yeah, just the idea that like there are train lines here that don't shut down blew my mind for the longest time. Like, what do you mean they don't shut down? That doesn't make any sense. How do they, Who who's on these buses at four in the morning or whoever wants to be? And I'm whoever like, needs to be, yeah. Like, what, what do you, what? Yeah, so it was definitely a bit of an adjustment period, but honestly, I it's one of the better decisions I've ever made, I think. Me too. Yeah. What, uh, tell me about your first classes. Were, they were at Second City, yes? Yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. So, um, you know, having a, like, a bit of a theater background, there's a lot of stuff that are in those first classes that you just, like, you're like, okay, I, I think I've felt this before. This, this feels familiar. It seems like something I'm not going to catch me by a surprise or anything like that. And it honestly took a couple classes before I actually felt like I was kind of getting anything out of it, to be honest with you. Um, I had a couple, because, you know, I get it. Second City is a business. They want to, their motto is essentially, we you're here because you're interested and we want to keep you interested. So we want to keep things kind of light to kind of keep you around for a little bit before there's a bit of um, what I would, I guess, describe as the, the shake up or somebody throwing a chair across the room in a way. Um, and I remember I was watching one of these earlier and somebody was saying they had went through an intensive and they had uh, Tim Sasko as a teacher. And they were saying <laughs> how they had had him for like a week and it was in between having two other people and just his temperament was different and people weren't necessarily prepared for that. And I remember I had some Tim Sasko as my third teacher and it very much was like a change, but it was the change I was kind of craving because I'm like, <gasps> We get to have notes. We're not all doing great. There are things to work on. Hooray. Like I've finally gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, thank goodness. I I know we weren't gonna get patted on the head and like be told good job the whole way out. It was nice to kind of eventually get to a point where it's like, yeah, that sucked, man. That mm -mm, that ain't it. <laughs> I'm like, thank God. Yeah, I don't know what and I don't know why that's a thing for like intro improv classes to be completely honest with I I mean I guess it just supports the business model and makes it easier but like I don't know I feel like you're getting a lot of people who need that sort of push if you will and like man I was I was craving that so bad where it's like if I didn't get that probably by the third class I probably would have stuck it out just because I moved all the way here for it but like I'd have been like super disappointed if by then it was like all right, somebody's got to say, like, all these scenes aren't great. I know it. I feel like I'm not sitting here watching this, like, free improv set and looking at ours and being like, it's the same. Yeah, I, I, I've i always said, like, at least with level ones, um, you need, not only do you need a good teacher, but I think you also need someone who's a bit of a cheerleader, which is mm -hmm. why Absolutely. Uh, during those few years where I tried teaching, I never did level ones because I was that same way. <laughs> I'm rather harsh. Um, and plus I preferred more detail work. So like, I never took level ones, like someone like, uh, like Harz, a perfect example is a great, great first level one teacher because he's such a cheerleader for everyone. 
Um, mm -hmm. But after that, I completely agree. Like, not so much to start like weeding people out, but like, mm -hmm. give, give me some actual things that I can work on. Like, yeah, I think we're the same in that way where I'm like, positive reinforcement doesn't work that well with me. So I don't mind mm -hmm. like kicking me in the ass a couple times. Like mm -hmm. that, that gets me up. So I totally. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Po oh. Any too much positive like reinforcement makes me paranoid because then my brain will start crafting things that are like, are they sure? Are they right? I don't know if that was like you. I think that's just the way the human brain is where you just find things. You're always going to find something that isn't going to be perfect for you, whether you get it from a teacher or not. But yeah, I, I would say once I got to that point with Tim Sasso, things kind of picked up a bit because I'm like, okay, he's actually given us a bit of a push. And I, I know a lot of people had like horror stories of their A through E experience. I actually, I felt pretty lucky in the fact that I kind of dug it. Uh, I feel like our class for the most part, I'd say from three, from I guess C to E, we, we stuck together pretty close. And it was actually a lot more diverse than a lot of that may be why I feel probably better about it is because it was a lot more diverse than a lot of, I would say it was about maybe 45% uh, POC, our graduating class, which I don't think, I'm pretty sure that's not the norm. I've, I've seen other E shows. I, I, <laughs> I would say I was very much the minority in that and got very lucky. Um, did you, so you went through A, A3 and then you mm -hmm. did conservatory? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jumped right into that. Uh, arms wide open. And, you know, by the, I think that's around the time it started to s not sour, but the way you kind of realize, all right, this feels like a chore by the end of it. Like, just because I think everybody or most people kind of have this experience with Second City. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm thankful for to having gone there and learned a lot of stuff, but by the time you get to the end of conservatory, I'd say the, the bloom kind of comes off the rose a little bit for you. And it's kind of this position of we're like, all right, it is this great place where all these people went and it is viewed as this wonderful house, but it is a business and business is business. You know what I mean? And it's like, I think I always got kind of upset about there would be certain things and I would be, you build this relationship with your group and that's your group. And then when people in the group don't get as many opportunities for things, you kind of bump for them. And then that kind of rubs you the wrong way. I think that's a lot of like, kind of how things went for me personally. I was just like, man, I like, you would have your buddies and we'd all talk all week about these things they'd pitch and everybody would think it'd be a good idea. And then your director of your conservatory so says, I'm just not feeling that we're not going to do it and I'm like I get but whose show is it then right. like you know like I don't I don't know that always kind of rubbed me the wrong way in a sense it's like and then you're making people reach in for something that they don't feel as strongly about I guess just because it fits the the brand or whatever or it'll look good for the producers there and I'm like but that's not always everyone's authentic selves so it always feels a little different. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't hit right. And I think, I don't know, that's kind of when things started, mm, started souring on me a little bit. It's like, you know, you'll still try and take advantage of opportunities there, but you, you also realize by that point, it had been two years of taking classes and doing things. You realize there are theaters everywhere. There are people doing stuff all over the place and you can branch out to other places and actually right after conservatory, once that had ended, I was kind of looking for something because I was like, I didn't get everything out of conservatory that I wanted. I should go somewhere else. That's when I actually signed up for comedy sports is like right after. I think I graduated conservatory and then started class maybe two weeks after, if not a week. It was like a, I should have taken more time probably, <laughs> but I was, you know, at the time we just like, we just yeah. want, want to keep beating ourselves that I get it. Who yeah. was your teacher? Uh, my first teacher was, it's hilarious. Uh, I signed up. My first teacher was supposed to be Stacey Smith and it ended up being Matt Castelvi. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it was honestly, it was great. It was a uh, short form, which I had no prior experience in really, but I had always thought that was like a part of 
my game that was kind of lacking, getting the things quicker. I don't know why. I think the idea of like setting, like as a child, seeing things and watching sitcoms, always assuming there's more time in my head to build the things than there really is in improv. So I was like, I could use this. Let's just get to things quicker. Let's try and like sharpen these skills and like short form is the way to do it. And he was a, honestly pretty great for his teacher. Like just very, like it was a decent balance of like, all right, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be a bit of a cheerleader for you, but also I'm fine telling you that was crap. You know, you know, right? Like you've been here before. Like that was kind of the vibe he gave off. That is, that is very much his vibe. <laughs> that, <laughs> I think that's just his life vibe. Uh, <laughs> all right, so you had, uh, you had Castelvi and then um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you did all the levels and then- Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I did all the levels. By the time I get to the end of it, um, me and my class, we got real tight. We did our little graduation show. It was very fun. Uh, and then we go to audition for ensemble and, you know, not really thinking too much of it. I'm like, okay, I'll just audition. I'm sure I'll, I feel pretty good about what I've done here. I feel pretty good about who I am as a performer. I think I can make the, uh, the uh, gosh, I want to say it was, was it minor league at the time still? I feel like it had a different name, but I may be thinking uh, something different. Was it house party? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm sure I'll make a house party team. It like whatever. So I go in and I audition and I just happen to make ensemble. I don't know whether the stars aligned or whether I mean those were I'd say the first audition I had was pretty good. You, you just know when you have a pretty good audition. Oh, like, totally. I but I was like, there's no way they're calling me back for that. And they call me back and I'm like, oh boy, I got this call back. And then that one, I was like, that was okay. That's okay. It's all right. I was like, I'm definitely on house team. No worries about it. No doubt about it. I'm going to get a house team call. And then I get an email and it's like, on some, that, is that right? I don't know if that's, I'll say yes. And then they'll change it. They'll be like, oh no, we got your name mixed up. We wanted someone else, but we're still going to give you that house party slot. And they Nope. Turns out that was it. It was. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what what year was this that you got into the ensemble? Oh God, this feels so long ago now. This is a terrible. Okay, so hold on. If I'm doing backwards math, I want to say 2018. Because yes, yes, uh, it was myself. Uh, it was gosh, Todd Page was in there with us. Uh, Ashley Victoria, Fiona Stevens. Uh, I was this wasn't the class of 20, was it? There was maybe that's how it happened. It's the class, class of 20, 20 that's yeah, okay. that somehow became like now I don't know, seven people or something like that. I, I don't know how many of us are left standing. I know oh. Ali Ring's still there, like, yeah, it's like a it's a deep, <laughs> it happened so fast. I think that was the year that there was like changeover going on in the office and stuff. So it was like hmm. one group wanted, like one sect in the office wanted this group, another one at that group. And so I, I wasn't in the office then, but <laughs> everyone just went, you know what? Let's just take all of them. And next thing <laughs> we know, they're like introducing a class of 20. And I was yeah. like, what? This is so many. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I am thankful for whoever decided let's take all of them because who knows what would have panned out either uh, if it had gone the other way. But yeah, it was, yeah, it was a lot of us to start. Had you auditioned into another team or ensemble before comedy sports? Uh, no, the funny thing was no, I just, I remember getting out of conservatory and feeling like I'm at a pretty good spot, but I'm not where I wanna be and feeling like I just needed a little extra seasoning. I was like, I something doesn't feel fully there. I don't know if I like, you know, your friends are gonna be like, nah, man, you, you're doing great. Things are fine. We've seen you come so far, but in your head, you're like, some of that is probably true, but all of that can't be true. So it's just like, yeah, I, I wanted to get a little more training before I kind of ch chose to jump into anything else really. So then this was your first, was this your first team ever? Uh, first ensemble gig, yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So you really just train, 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 and then started auditioning. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 
it was i think it's because in even though i know it, auditioning for improv is different i think i had already had the idea of what auditioning is like kind of in my head just from like theater stuff so it's like it i feel like it kind of translates a bit so i was like all right let's just improve improve as much as you can or until you feel comfortable doing improv because i think i had seen so much improv by that time i'd probably psych myself out a little bit about it where it's just like man all these people are so good and uh, i don't know they're they're filling up all these shows and all these houses all the time who the hell am i and it's like you get in your head about it and at that point you don't even you don't do anything you don't even pull the trigger and see where you are just just to see yeah, you, you think you think you have to like be at a certain point before you can even start doing that, and then that imposter syndrome starts to kick in where you're like, yep. this isn't me, I'm not this." I <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, I yeah. totally get that. Absolutely. Get that. So you get into the ensemble, you have your few weeks of of classes and training and all that, and you start doing shows. How is that? How how are you feeling now? That you're <laughs> You're finally Dress. on the stage doing <laughs> your jersey. Oh, stressful. Stress. I, it's funny you talk about the imposter syndrome for before you even audition, because ooh, baby, it, it comes in, it lays on thicker when once you make that other on the other side. Because then you're like, I mean, maybe this is just me, because then I'm just like, Oh man, everyone's gonna be looking at me. I'm the new guy. Everyone's gonna be like, well, let's see what this guy can do. Like, you know, they group this guy in, he better be good. And you start getting in your head about it and it just becomes such a thing. And I don't, I remember one of the first shows I did, I invited some friends and I'll never forget while doing uh, five things cause we were indoors at the time. Um, I got a brown bag foul for cursing while guessing. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's, I guess if I could, if I could share how, how stressful it was for me when, yeah, when you start cursing during five things, uh, yeah, it's getting to you a little bit. <laughs> uh, but you know, over time you get a little bit more relaxed. You try and find, find your groove, find the niche, you know, you're like, you know, these games, you just got to go out there and play and have fun. And as much as you want to serve those people, you also, the people out there who come, you have to serve yourself because that's, that's where you're going to find the fun is finding that middle ground between entertaining and also doing things that you enjoy, that you're having fun doing, that you feel like you're doing to the best of your ability. So how long was it before you felt uh comfortable enough to start either reaching out to other theaters or auditioning for other stuff because i know at some point you end up with your own show that you yeah host so yeah how long was it from like you make the ensemble you start doing shows to you know welcome justin swinson hosting his own uh, show? <laughs> uh i would say it took a couple i would say it I would say I kind of had the idea after I got out of conservatory. I think conservative, like, I was like, let me get the Second City classes out the way. And then I jumped right into comedy sports. But once I was done doing classes at comedy sports, I was like, okay, now I have the time to actually try these other avenues and see what happens and audition for stuff at IO and audition for like, stuff at Second City or the annoyance and end up doing some other things. I think it's all just like, like everybody else, finding that balance of time between, okay, I'm going to work. All right, here's when I have these rehearsals. When can we squeeze in maybe a show or like being an ensemble member for another thing on top of all this and trying to, because man, there was a time where I feel like everybody gets this, right? Where you're like, at some point you're juggling like five different things and you're like, when the fuck did this happen? How did, what? When did I get all these things? And then you try and like reassess and like scratch some things off and try and work back. And then it's like a cycle it almost feels like. Oh, definitely. Um, wh was there a time where you were like, I got things like six days a week. Um, and oh. I, there was definitely a time after I landed here where I was trying to get that going. And I would ask mm -hmm. people, the question I would ask people is, how often do you 
just go home after work. And it would always be like, I don't know, one, two nights a week. I'm like, yeah. do you really have that much stuff that you're doing? And they're like, yeah, that's, you know, it's kind of my, it's kind of what I do. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I would like to say to anyone who sees this, anyone who feels the idea of like, I have to have as many things going on at once as I, don't believe it. It's a trap. I promise you it's a lie. It is not. It has no value. You have no less value than anyone who has a week's worth of stuff. If you just have one day of stuff, I, I tell you what, because after a while, it's just there's no way you can execute six days of performance in six different things. There's no way it's impossible. Like you, you're going to spread yourself too thin. Eventually, you'll run yourself down and you'll start hating it. And that's the last thing you want. Yeah, for me, it wasn't even so much that it had that view of impossible, but it was more just like, if I were to do this, there would really be no room for anything else. And mm-hmm. I, as much as I love this, I, I don't want this to just be my whole life. I, mm-hmm. You know, I, I want to I wanna have a significant other every once in a while or yeah. a movie yeah. or just get, get together with my friends and drink. Like, I want to have yep. a well-rounded life and... And giving this much time to this, as much as I love it, is just, it, it's not going to benefit me because I don't get to be a well-rounded person at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. There was definitely a time where I got to that point where I'm like, this is the whole, like, you would have, like, friends at work, be like, hey, man, what are you getting into this weekend? And then you'd be like, I have this, and then I have this, and then I have this. And they're like, but, like, what are you doing for fun? And you're like, oh, no, this is all fun. And you, after a while, it's, you're like, is it? It, it is rehearsal after rehearsal after like sitting down to write something fun like where's the time for the for the other stuff it's yeah. it, it happens so fast that uh that lifestyle was kind of the way you had to do it in la in order just to just survive not to succeed yeah. to just survive yeah. And so it, it, that's why I eventually ended up leaving. Not because of like it defeated me or, or I felt like, oh, I can't do this. It was more just like, if that's what it's going to take to quote unquote, make it, then mm-hmm. I, don't want it. I don't want it because I will get to the top and realize I'm alone because I yep. didn't have time for anything else but this. And yeah, that's not, that's not like knocking anyone who's doing it that way. But for sure. me, I was just like, that's not how it's going to work for me. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I won't find happiness in that. Yeah. Uh, so now, you know, we've been um, we've been online for, God, almost a year now. Um, where, where, where are you feeling since, you know, you you haven't done like a, a slew of shows? How, how are you yeah. feeling right now about about, you know, coming back or, you know, moving forward? You know, for the longest time, I was, I don't want to say against, I just wasn't fully on board with the online thing because it's very much, I don't know, I guess it was a very like, (laughs) like an OG mentality of like, no, it has to be live in the theater. People have to see it and feel it. (laughs) And like, no, it, it truly does not. It just, you know, you, you can, evolve and you can find ways to change it and modify it and it'll grow it'll just grow and if it comes back to live and in person it'll just make things that much better because you will have learned stuff from online that also works um so i'm actually pretty excited about trying to get back very soon uh if i could say i I just yeah it it took me a while to kind of like get through it and mentally kind of get past it because honestly i think it's great I hate to say that there have been positives about the pandemic, but I do feel like it has kind of created this great purification almost of the scene right now that I think one, everybody probably needed a break. Two, it, there was a bit of oversaturation just in the city overall, I think. I mean, that's just my opinion. I don't know if you feel that way, but like, I just feel like every theater had 27 million shows going on that would have like, I don't know, maybe a dozen people in each of them. And I'm like, after a while, is that really what the scene needs or like, or what anyone wants after a certain point? So it's kind of good that 
we've had this pandemic, things have slowed down and it's given people the idea to either take a break or find new ways to be creative and like push the boundaries of what we're doing now. Right. Yeah. I, I, I think it's like, yeah, it, it, I like that people had a way to, to just kind of have an idea and then just do it. I've said that a lot about like improv here in Chicago and how quick someone is just like, I have this idea and they have it on Mm -hmm. by Friday, the show's up. Um, Mm -hmm. um, It's a very Chicago thing, but, um, but now it's not even so much like, I, I think where a lot of people might've tripped up or felt weird about it was, I think a lot of people literally just tried to take the show they did live and literally just like, now let's just put it online. Yep. We started creating our show for online. The first thing we said was, we can't just transfer the show. That's not going to work. It was literally, I remember that first meeting and it was the first thing we said. So that was the basis of everything was like, we can't just transfer the show because it can't, it, it's not going to work because the show mm-hmm. is going to be live. So we Mm -hmm. had to figure out what that online version was going to look like. And, you know, those first Zoom shows were clunky as hell. And (laughs) those first Twitch shows were clunky as hell, too. But now, you know, we're finding our footing and we're looking, you know, beyond just the comedy sports show to new programming. And, you know, we're considered digital first now. And we've completely reinvented the way we do it, uh, Mm -hmm. mostly here in Chicago. Whereas, you know, some of our other sister cities are essentially transferring the show and it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. It's, mm-hmm. it's a different world. Like you're saying, we're trying to figure out something completely brand new. Are you yeah. are, are you scheduled for shows already? I put in availability, so we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, though, I have no idea where my jerseys are. Um, but I figured that's not a difficult problem to solve. No. <laughs> if that's holding you back, you can borrow mine. I don't, I just, just get you back up there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what are you what are you thinking for yourself now that like, you know, this thing went longer than we expected it to, and the way yeah. it's going, you know, people probably won't be doing any live shows till maybe the winter. I mean. Yeah. What do you, what do you, what was, what was the goal beforehand and Mm -hmm. has that changed at all or are you looking into something else? Uh, The goal has, has always been, I have, since I was a very little boy and I probably stayed up way too late and snuck into my mom's room. I've always, like, I remember telling my mom when I was a little kid, I wanted to work uh, on the Arsenio Hall show. Um, to date myself a little bit um but late night tv has always kind of been like what i've been the most fascinated by the most interested in and that's always kind of been the goal the interesting thing about it now is um like everything else in life late night shows have had to drastically uh change how they do things and how they work and how they move especially during a pandemic, especially during an election like the one we've just had. Um, so honestly, what's what's become, I guess, a new objective, if you will, for me is figuring out how to, one, create something for myself that is like that. Because like you said, I did have a show I did live and oof, you're not lying when you say you can't just take the, the live show and put it online. Lord knows I tried. <laughs> and like sitting down with a bunch of people who you've done a show with for nearly two years and thinking it's a layup, we can do this easy. It is not. It is so different and so tough. And I'm just like, man, I guess I got to start from scratch. We got to start from the beginning. You got to literally re- rebuild the wheel, essentially. Um, We've done it for so long that like we sometimes forget what being bad at something feels like. And as mm-hmm. soon as you try to get back into that, it's, you know, we're immediately like, oh, no, 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 I don't like that. Mm-hmm. We abandon, yeah. We abandon that feeling <laughs> instead, of, yeah. instead of pushing through it. And I can definitely say, like, I am guilty of that so oh, many same. times. It, it's same. Being this far into my improv career and now, you know, at almost 40, yeah. being, ah, 
right back to oh boy how does that and it is like yeah ugh. it's it's such an interesting and humbling experience to try and like accept failure again <laughs> like just to like fall flat on your face again it's such a like when you're like in your 20s you're like you know what i can i can take those lumps it's fine but man there is something different to it when you are like in your 30s i don't know what it is where maybe it's just like time has kind of like built you up in your mind a little bit where you can't fail again but i mean jesus christ outside of like comedy realm how many people fail at 30 and 40 and 50 all the time and still come up with great things after you know what i mean the 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 way it always felt to me was like when you're a baby improviser the things you need are like very broad. You need to work on scenes. You need to work on yes and. You need to work on <laughs> listening. But the more you do it, the specific, the, the specificity of the thing that you need is smaller hmm. and smaller and smaller as time goes. So when you've been doing it for a while and what you need is this big, it's gonna take yeah. a while to find what that is. Mm -hmm. So each time like, we we stop looking as it keeps getting smaller and smaller because it's just like well i don't i don't you know i'm 20 years in i, <laughs> I don't actually need now it, it's not yeah. just scene work it's very specific sort of scene work and very specific sort of listening and mm -hmm. that's again, that's the sort of stuff that scares us off because immediately you're like oh i'm bad at this i'm out <laughs> back to the old comfort zone <laughs> Yeah, he's like, why? Why would I do that when I have these great moves here? What are you talking about? Um, well, uh, Justin, believe it or not, we are coming towards the end of our time. Um, huh. um, I know, right? That went by fast, but we'll definitely bring yeah, it because I I would love to hear um, where you are in your head after having done a few shows. So I'll, you know, yeah. I'll back. what are we in now? Towards the end of January, check back yeah. in towards the end of March. We'll make sure right. you in there because I, I want to hear how you're feeling now that you've done a few uh, online shows and where where you are with that. Uh, but, <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, going to be a ball of nerves, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. We all have. <laughs> it's weird. You know, you're looking at a screen instead of looking at a person. There's no audience. Mm -hmm. Maybe a laugh or two. Like, it is a whole <laughs> new world. But I think you're going to rock it. I'm very excited for you to come back. <laughs> Um, any final thoughts before we go? Oh, man. Oh, what a just honestly, while you have this time, just make time for yourself. It, it we're never going to have this much free time again in any aspect, I think. And it's really as much as it is, as this is like a tough time and a difficult time. I think we have to remember that we can make the best of any situation. Yeah. I, I so, love it. Yeah. And, you know, I, we've been working on this stuff for so long that I, I myself have actually been trying to remember that, like, the last few weeks has been a yeah. lot of that. Like, the last year, the emotional labor of it has finally kind of shown its ugly head, and I'm trying to remember, like... Yeah, man. Despite, despite having all this free time, make some time for you and some fun, dumb stuff that is just... Yeah. Free. I've discovered so many random things about myself over the last God, 10 months where it's just like, man, I would have never, if we were still grinding at this, I would have never known. I would have never discovered it. So that, at least give it a shot. Awesome. Well, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Uh, please find us on Twitch. Please find us on Facebook and find us on Instagram, uh, CSZN. We have programming, uh, by the time I put this up, we're going to have programming six days a week. Every, the only day Ooh. we won't is Tuesdays because that's when we rehearse. So <laughs> uh, find us on Twitch, find our channel. Please watch and please follow DNI Talks on YouTube. And we will see you all next time. Justin, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me.